Love. Um, I think we can all recognize that there isn't a lot of diversity in games right now. It's increasing. If this was Dragon Ball Z, the number on the scout would be going higher, which is good. <laughs> so even beyond art and entertainment, as we all know, there are a few consequences to a medium without diverse voices, Sarkeesian and all this other stuff. But even if we just take a look at the games themselves, there's a lot of... Um, and also, those are my favorite images on the internet. So what are some things we can do about that? Well, there's quite a few things that we can do to make gaming a more inclusive and interesting place, and that's what I'm hoping to talk about for the next 20 minutes. So my name is Chris Elgu, local Brooklyn game developer. My uh, day job is in project management, and I wear a lot of hats during the game development process. Not actual hats, although maybe I'll get some of those eventually. I've been to a lot of game jams, and some of my games have been pretty well received. Um, the one on the upper right is called Five Stages, and uh, that got displayed in an arcade in Five Stages, and I was pretty happy about that. Uh, yeah, the characters are shooting each other with words. It, it's that sort of game. Uh, recently, my friends and I formed a company called The Brooklyn Gamery, and uh, we make games and game-related events. Um, it's currently myself, Kat Small, who presented earlier, and Dennis Leal. Brooklyn Gamery has two games in the oven right now. One is a mobile action game, and one is a magical girl brawler for four players. You'll notice that these characters look nothing like the characters on the earlier slides. This is completely intentional, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. So, just so we're all on the same page, a game jam is a section of time where participants make a small game from scratch. Well, certain definitions of scratch. None of them expect you to make a game out of machine code in a weekend. There's a lot of variability. It can be a day, a weekend, or a month. It can take place on location or on the internet. It's a great way to get practice at making games and have another finished project under your belt. It's actually kind of how I got into game development, so game jams are near and dear to my heart. In my opinion, game jams are great for making gaming more inclusive. It's not a big time commitment, which encourages people who normally wouldn't develop games to try it out. And once the game jam is done, you have a lot of great new games that weren't there one week ago. Sometimes these games can go on to do great things, like uh, Nina Freeman's How Do You Do It started in a game jam, and now it's everywhere. So you've decided to make a game jam. That's awesome. We're all very excited about it. There are a lot of things to figure out if you want to run an event. Chief among them, where will it be? How will we tell people about it? And is there Wi-Fi? As is our tendency in a lot of areas, we started up a Google Doc, and we started uh, writing down questions that we wanted to figure out. These are a few of them. We were fortunate to have some friends at Arcadium, which is a game company that runs a lot of game jams. They seem like good people to ask. In general, asking questions is an awesome thing to do. There are only so many sides of the picture that any of us can see. Plus, it's free. I mean, most of the time. If you're putting a game jam together, you can make the theme anything you want. This is a great opportunity to take a look at gaming as a whole and uh, see if there are some areas that don't have enough games for your liking. In our case, we thought about motherhood, which is very important to quite a few people, and yet has very few games about it. Can any of you think of a game that has motherhood as a major theme of the story or in the mechanics? Once we decided that motherhood was the theme we wanted, we set about looking for an awesome name, and I think we found one. <laughs> and much fun was had by all. We got some really cool games out of it, which is one of the rewards of running a game jam. We got a game where penguins throw their babies at each other, a four-player food gathering game with really sick art, and this game where you guide your fairy children through a dangerous forest. Uh, this was actually made by Arthur Ward, if any of you know him. And uh, during the playthrough, people gasped when a piece of wood fell on the little blue circles. Yeah, video games, they're powerful. <laughs> this is a game that won. Part of the reason we were able to do this is because we were able to get some really great sponsors. Uh, they provided us with money and prizes and a venue. Uh, to get these, we sent out emails to just about everyone we could think of. Uh, they didn't all land. For example, we tried emailing Planned Parenthood, which seemed relevant. That didn't stick, unfortunately. But that would have been cool. Sponsors are awesome for event planning. They can really take a lot of stress off and help you provide a lot of great things, like food and prizes, which are important. 
So eventually some time passed and we decided we wanted to make another game jam. This time we wanted to make one about gender, sexual identity, and relationships. We called it the Super Love Jam. We were committed from the very beginning towards being as inclusive as possible and running the best event we could. We reached out to quite a few people and had quite a few revisions before this policy was complete. Creating a space for people to feel safe will help them relax and do great work. It's also the right thing to do. An anti-harassment policy is a great way to make it very clear that shitty behavior will not be tolerated. This is another thing that I'm super proud of. Uh, we looked for as many ways to be as inclusive as possible, and gender-neutral restrooms is a part of it. This language also went through a lot of revisions, and we spoke with a lot of people. Uh, we worked with our venue, which at the time was NYU's Magnet Center, and they were super helpful with uh, getting this set up. And it was a good time. I personally am a huge fan of extensive question and answer sessions after game jams. I think I realized this during one of the global game jams where the global games had just gotten so big that they didn't have time for long presentations anymore, which I thought was a big loss, because presentations are great. In my opinion, some of the best learning takes place during events like this. Super Love Jam turned out to be really successful, and we got a lot of great feedback. A lot of people asked when we would do another one, which was super encouraging. We got a lot of really cool games out of it, too. These are a few of them. If you want to check them out, you can search for Super Love Jam and Game Jolt. We were able to get some awesome sponsors for this last game jam, too. So we were pretty lucky when we were putting these game jams together. Nothing went terribly wrong or even wrong at all. Uh, we found that there were a couple of things that worked for us. We started with a very strong idea of what we wanted to do, and this applies to games or projects or art collectives or whatever else we're putting together. Along with knowing what it was that we were doing, it also helped to know what it wasn't, and this really helps uh, you when you're making decisions. In both of our game jams, we wanted to have inclusive events with interesting socially conscious themes. This helps guide our choices in sponsorship, judging, materials, and a lot of other areas. Brooklyn Gamery's jam ideas were also rooted in our own diversity. We're a super diverse team, and so if you've got those things, that helps. There was actually a recent case in the news that I learned about through Ash's Twitter. The uh, Anita Borg Institute runs an event called the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, and they have GoDaddy as a sponsor. So if you've seen any of GoDaddy Super Bowl ads, you can see how this could be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> and since their goal is to celebrate women partnering with a company that, you know, doesn't always, might not have been the best idea, and keeping this in mind during their event planning might have helped them avoid some issues. We found that doing lots of homework is helpful, even if you aren't in school. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-work can refer to all sorts of things that occur before the main events. This includes planning, outreach, and research. As tedious as it can feel, and it can feel tedious, it yields a lot of benefits. Thinking ahead can help you anticipate and plan for issues and make sure that you have great systems in place if anything does happen. In my opinion, the more of this you can do, the better. We've received a lot of great advice as we were planning our jams. Input from others has helped us get off the ground and helped make our events even more inclusive. You probably have access to a lot of really knowledgeable people in your own social circle. If not, just talk to someone at the next NYC Games thing. They're usually pretty friendly. This is similar to advice, but has a few differences, and plus I wanted to make a different slide. <laughs> so help is a really broad word to use, which is good because events need a lot of it. Help can include sponsorships or prizes and food, people to watch the equipment and make sure nobody's being harassed, a venue to host your event in, and lots of other things. It can come from all sorts of places, so definitely don't be afraid to ask as many places as you can think of. This is an example of some of the help. So if you're able to you know, get some sweet sponsors, uh, you can do budgeting, which really isn't as bad as it sounds. Uh, we figured out how much cash we had available and how to split that cash up so everything would be covered. Uh, you can see the planning on the left and the rewards on the right. Delicious, delicious Chinese food. <laughs> uh, food, incidentally, is another way that you can take care of your attendees and be inclusive. Uh, in our case, we tried hard to have a lot of vegetarian options and some gluten-free stuff. And finally, once that's all done, go ahead and give it a try. 
Uh, if you've done all of this pre-work, then you should be in pretty good shape. And uh, one more thing, this isn't something that we've done, but uh, we've seen it work really well for a lot of other teams. Uh, you can target your events toward uh, specific populations. For example, Code Liberation has run several women-only game jams. Are there any questions about game jams or the previous uh, set of slides? Okay, so we also make games. These are both in production, but we've learned a lot along the way. Our first game, Prism Shell, actually started at Game Jam, so everything comes full circle. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that the main character of this game doesn't look like all of those, you know, white guys in my first couple of slides, and this was completely intentional. Uh, we made this decision early on at the Game Jam. The elaboration of the character was interesting as well. Um, for example, what does a badass space warrior wear? Kat suggested that we give her some comfortable shoes. I mean, I wear shoes every day, and I never would have thought for an instant that comfortable shoes are something you should think about during character design. But, I mean, it makes sense. You're fighting monsters all day. You don't want to get blisters. This is another example of how important it is to bring in other people for their perspective. You'll always learn something new. All of us love local multiplayer. And we knew we wanted to make a four-player brawler game, and Magical Girl seemed like the awesomest choice. Immediately, you notice a few things based on these images. For one thing, the characters are all women. What? Can they do that? Whoa. <laughs> when you're making a video game, you can make the characters whatever you want. Uh, you'll notice the same character has three skin tones in the upper left. Uh, this is something that I'm actually pretty excited about. We use shaders to generate a random skin tone for your avatar every time you play. And there are a lot of really interesting conversations leading up to that, but it's a great way to unobtrusively add a lot of variety to your game and to create a more diverse experience for your players. So what's working for us in this area? If you have a diversity-based idea for your game, identify it early on and make sure that it's included throughout the development process. This will help you make sure that it's an organic part of your game and that your game really expresses your goals. You've probably noticed by now that I think that getting input is pretty much the greatest. Actually, um, during the development process of Dragon Age 3, the writers were all set to move forward on a new plot. And I quote, We've all read it first, then written down our thoughts, and go around the table to relate any issues we encountered. As it happened, most of the guys went first. Typical stuff. Some stuff was good, some stuff needed work, etc. Then one of the female writers went, and she brought up an issue. A big issue. It had to do with a sexual situation in the plot, which she explained could easily be interpreted as a form of rape. End quote. One of the writers spoke up, pointed out that it was really creepy, and they all realized that she was right. We all have our blind spots. Talking things out can help with character design, game design, marketing, and other parts of your project. If you can do something cool with your programming to add diversity, please do. That kind of thing is awesome. Randomness like this is uh, one possible way to do it. You can also have the game treat your character differently depending on their internal traits or a lot of other ways you can express these ideas. Similar to what the thing from coding are game design changes. Now, I think games are great at representing systems, and systems are often how injustice is perpetuated in the world, and sometimes resolved, I guess. Say you have a game where one player is Walmart and the other is a local business, then the Walmart player would have a lot more money. <laughs> like, a little bit. <laughs> Similarly, you can explore a great amount of uh, systematic issues by running them directly into your rules. So in summary, committing to an idea, doing homework, getting advice, getting help, and going for it are all things that we found to be super helpful in our events and games. This is the end of the presentation. Does anyone have any questions either about games or game jams? Thank you. No. Cancel the applause, I uh, Some people have questions, I think. I think we've, like, a lot of what you said has helped, but um, do you think there's any other advice you can give to us since, you know, we're such a spread out community and trying to put something together? 
Uh, well, if you're a spread out community, one thing that might be a good idea is to host it over the internet instead of having it be an in-person game jam. But I think having a community and having the desire laid out that you want to have a game jam is a great first step, and uh, the rest of it should all flow from there. Any other questions? So I haven't actually played it, but I read a lot of TV tropes, so it's pretty much like I have, but uh, Fallout uh, has characters treat you a lot differently, like if you know you have different scores in certain areas. Uh, similarly, another game that I haven't played, but uh, Morrowind and Skyrim, those you know fantasy dragon sort games, uh, depending on your character's race, you know people can be racist to you or you know say you know fantasy game slurs about you. And, that sort of thing. So that's some areas that uh, have been covered in games, and you know, there's a lot of room in that area to explore. I think. Anyone else? Oh. How do you assess whether your game jams are as effective as you want them to be? Uh, well, you can take a look at the uh, attendees that you have in the games. Uh, one thing that we also found a lot of value in is just uh, setting up a form on Google Docs and where people can write in how satisfied they were, what did you like about it, what could be better next time, and so on. And that's a great way to get metrics on what you're doing so you can make your future events even better. What, uh, what are, do you set up goals ahead of time for what you want those metrics to be? Uh, we actually haven't. We just kind of made events and hoped for the best. But that might be something that we would do in the future. I have thrown a bunch of events, so I don't recommend it. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Uh, when is the next game jam you'll be hosting, and what, what theme are you looking into? Uh, we haven't started planning it yet. Um, probably the best way to find out about it would be to uh, follow the company uh, Brooklyn Gamery, either on Twitter or on Facebook, and you'll be able to find out about um, our upcoming events. Okay, everyone can resume applause. <laughs>